But we are live uh, with How Do You Coach Blended Learning, uh, our roundtable where we get to ask questions and hopefully get some answers to um, sort of our approaches to coaching blended learning, um, both from our perspective here in DPS, and I'll let um, the other members of the roundtable introduce themselves. I think we're going to have a couple of other people join us um, in between here, but I want to make sure that everybody knows uh, who everybody is. So if you want to introduce yourself and then talk about a little bit your entrance into the world of blended learning, because I do think that uh, that the origin story is is something that's actually pretty powerful for this. Um, so my name is Ben Wilkoff. Um, I'm Director of Personalized Professional Learning uh, in Denver Public Schools, and uh, my entrance in here was, um, was really blogging with my students, my seventh and eighth grade uh, English students in 2004 and 2005 and everything else is just a, uh, uh, a, a um, I would say, um, a casualty of, of that sing singular event. So, um, Tracy, I'm going to swing it to you because you've got a couple of people there and I want to hear um, from your perspective um, and everybody that's there. Awesome. I'm Tracy Crott and um, we are a team from Liberty, Missouri. Um, right outside of Kansas City, and um, we just went one to one, um, nine twelve, and are starting to really work on the blended learning. And I've got my coach, or the coaches that are here, and I'll let them introduce you themselves. I'm Sarah Wickham. Hello, I'm Sarah. I'm Scott Hickey. And then we've got I'm Tara Harvey. Hello. And then, do you guys want to tell them kind of um, our? Would you like to tell them our our path with blended learning? Yeah, so we started last semester with uh, two teachers at our high school, an English teacher and a chemistry teacher, uh, piloting a blended classroom environment uh, and with just one hour a day. And then this year, our entire high school staff went one-to-one. -one, and so we're moving toward more of a course structure where our entire personal finance and health teams are going to blend their classes and so we're looking to learn a lot and figure out choose the best ways to move forward with growing our program successfully. Awesome. Is that everybody? Can I, is that speak for everybody or are there some other origin stories in there? That speaks for everybody because <laughs> we were brought on. <laughs> I love it. All right, so um, let's throw it also then to um, our other participants here. Um, Daniel, um, how is, what's your entrance and, and what do you do in the world? Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, I'm with Ben over here in um, Denver Public Schools. I work at two schools, Mavlona Elementary and um, DCIS Mount Bello, which is a middle school, high school. And um, essentially I'm a, I don't know, I, I guess I would consider myself a lot of types of coaches from, from math to instructional tech to blended, um, but my main role is to support teachers and in integration of technology, and that's kind of gone into blended, but uh, my, my entrance into the field, now that I reflect on it, is um, when I taught uh, sixth grade, I applied for a grant and got a card of um, netbooks, and I, I kind of got my hands into Moodle a little bit, and uh, really just had a passion for personalized learning for kids. Like I, I felt like um, with my large class sizes, I think we have like 40 kids in a class. Um, I, I wanted all the kids to uh, get what they needed from, from math. And I felt that if we could, you know, kind of put it all out there online and they could access it um, at their own pace and whatever they needed to, and they kind of kept track of themselves of where they were, um, that it would be like this perfect system. And, um, so we kind of played around with that, and then eventually, I guess, it became known as blended learning. So, so have you found it to be the perfect system that you envisioned? <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, I felt like I was all alone, and then I got to know uh, people like you, Ben, and others who are doing this, and it's it's much bigger than um, I ever dreamed, and there's a lot more work. But I, but I, I do truly feel that um, there's no package deal. Like that's what I was going for when I started. You know, how can we package this and I can give it to other teachers? But 
Um, more recently, I've realized that uh, I think probably every classroom is going to look a little different. So nice. So, uh, Mark, you actually have a, a really broad um, base of, of knowledge, and I'd love to hear about your perspective and your entry point, um, and then a little bit about you, because you come at it from a, a little bit of a different angle. Yeah, thanks. Um, I was a 20-year a classroom teacher, and I, I started kind of blending the learning, I would say, I don't know, maybe six or seven years ago I started with message boards and and then moved to um, blogging and a classroom website and uh, it, you know I just it was an amazing experience seeing kids sort of you know come to life and be completely engaged in learning because they love technology so much so um, uh, you know I kinda changed everything I did in the classroom I moved away from traditional teaching entirely and really made it students Centered, and that ultimately led to um, a book called Role Reversal and um, a, a, another book called The Five-Minute Teacher and it's all about student-centered learning and small group work and project-based learning and um, assessment using digital tools and uh, you know that's kind of what got me here and now actually I'm, I'm consulting full-time and I'm doing this kind of stuff I'm doing a lot of webinars and hangouts and getting out in front of teachers and uh, you know Dan talked about packaging it up and saying how do you do it here's how you do it and I'm, I'm doing a whole lot of that it's really exciting nice well I really appreciate you uh, joining with us today and uh, you know taking some of your your time uh, away to to do that I'm uh, I'm interested in in hearing um, some responses to some of the questions that were put into the to the Google uh, the Google Doc. Um, so if you want to take a look at some of these, um, uh, you can kind of see them coming. Um, now I know Tracy, you and your team have a have a good host of questions too, so I want to make sure that we get to those. Um, but we're going to be sourcing the questions from the Google Doc, from the question and answer that's live, and then from all of the uh, folks on the on the the round table as well and so um, so one of the questions that I, I think actually speaks to a little bit of what you mark and and Dan what you were talking about um, I'm interested in how do you actually move folks from a packaged um, sort of set of online programs like I'm purchasing content this is now my blended learning program mm -hmm. How do you move from, uh, you know, sort of this prepackaged or canned online program into more true blended learning? And obviously, you know, we can spend probably the entirety of this hour just defining blended learning, but I'm okay with you sort of saying this is what it means to me and then, and then thinking about um, how, it, how it sort of feels from that, that canned perspective. Um, so, Dan, uh, do you want to... Uh, try the, uh, a crack at that one, moving teachers from canned online <laughs> programs to sort of more true blended learning? Um, you know, I, I, I definitely um, I don't think I have a, a specific answer or strategy there just because I feel like my teachers are so different, like where, um, where they are and where they are com like with technology and how comfortable they are with technology in the idea of giving up control in the classroom and, and truly letting um, kids uh, personalize their learning um, and kind of pace their learning. Um, I, and I'm really cautious of that because it, it, if you try to jump in, I feel like too quickly, you'll lose teachers and they'll bail out on you. And so um, I, I guess this is um, just as difficult as defining blended learning. I feel like um, it's just a teacher-by-teacher -teacher basis, but usually they have to have um, a passion for, hey, I really want to use um, um, data to know where my kids are, and that I want to be able to um, kind of cherry pick um, content that's out there, or create content, or, or take it from the kids, and then turn that into um, the coursework. And so, um, you know, we don't, so then we're not purchasing kind of the content packages, we're not using the, the um, LMSs as to the traditional LMSs. They're building websites. They're, um, you know, hosting their stuff on a even like a Google Doc or something simple like that. But um, yeah, I think there's lots of different paths to get there. Nice, and I love the the idea of actually 
sort of moving them and and sort of saying, uh, um, you know, when you're thinking about control, who has the control in the classroom? So um, I know that Kevin just joined, but I'm going to give him a minute to settle. And, and Mark, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on taking that perspective from how do you make sure that, that the teachers aren't necessarily the ones who are in total control in the classroom, um, but actually letting the students own a lot of that? Um, because in sort of my thoughts around blended learning are really around student ownership. Sure, I'm done. I'm leaving. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Sorry, I had somebody <laughs> uh, and, and to send the work around his way. Um, you, you know, I, one of the things that uh, Dan said that sort of resonated with me was, uh, you know, you, you really want to get away from the canned stuff, and I think that's really where we've been in blended learning for a while is this whole idea of, you know, you go out and you get maybe a paid program, some kind of tutorial, and you put the kids in a computer lab, and, and that becomes your blended learning. And uh, what, what really worked for me was finding web tools. And, uh, you know, I, I did create my own classroom website. I used a wiki host, and it was sort of a learning management system. But kids were able to have their own websites that they could kind of control and create their own look. And um, they really liked that. First of all, I think autonomy is a big thing. You know, giving kids a chance to create something that looks like it's their own. They're really big into that. From there, I said, okay, well, you know, what can I find that I can enhance learning and that kids will enjoy and also let them guide and drive a little bit, you know, and say, hey, how do you like this tool? I, I investigated this. I found this online. Someone that I follow on Twitter said, hey, you know, go check out this really great web tool or assessment tool, um, you know, and I could start rattling off names of tools. I don't know if that's, you know, if we're going to get into that or not, but there's tons of great things. And then they would go, oh, yeah, I like this. I'd like to have more of this. And ultimately, uh, I think you want kids to kind of have their own, what I call a technology toolkit, where they've got a whole host of web tools and they can apply them back to learning. And not. Uh, and I think once you kind of ease teachers into that and say, hey, take a look at this and try it and get your feet wet, then they start going out on their own and kind of flying with it. Yeah, I, and I would agree that there is this element of, of, you know, you have to build some of these things and show what's possible. Um, but there's a question here that I, I, I struggle with a lot. Um, and Joel just asked the question of, do you think you need some sort of online curriculum for teachers to be able to have the real-time data? And uh, Kevin, I'm going to throw that to you because I, I think it actually, you know, we, we struggle with this idea of each teacher is their own um, sort of creator, curator, they're creating their own classroom websites, you know, that, that kind of thing. And then, you know, there's this other side of things where wouldn't it be just easier if we went with or, or really tried to find that system that lets us aggregate all of our data in one place? You know, your website is different data than my website or, you know, our learning management systems don't talk to one another. So, Kevin, um, you know, from your perspective and how you kind of coach folks on, on the tools themselves, you know, how do you, how do you tackle that question? Okay, so it sounds like there's a, and actually, let me know if you're picking me up all right. Is We're good. Okay? All right, yeah, great. great. It took me 13 minutes to activate this thing out. I had a, it's like my computer's first time, I guess. <laughs> anyway, so um, the, the, the question you got to... Sorry, Kevin, I... Out there is uh, 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 coaching to the coaching around tools, and I'm gonna I'm gonna try to field. Uh, hopefully, if I if I'm missing anything, you can of course ask for follow up. But almost every time I've been doing coaching, a lot of people will be asking, "What's up? Are we good?" Sorry, um, somebody was remoting into my computer and playing music, which is just nice of them. <laughs> um, and so, so keep on going. Well, that's my soundtrack. That's my like, soundtrack, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was trying to. Was, uh, so anyway, so but I guess the the question about um, co coaching around the tools. Ultimately, you know, I've been looking at blended learning. Oh, maybe. Anybody else lose him? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
It's that DPS wireless, man. I know. There are three of us on website. it. I mean... Some of them work better with others, right? So, uh, uh-oh, what is, what's the giggle? I'm seeing giggles. <laughs> Dude, you're cutting, we're losing you're, giggle. You're like cutting in and out. Time. You might go up to, your, up to your settings and lower the... High bandwidth? Yeah, lower your bandwidth to, to kind of the lower <laughs> lower side of things. My favorite is when we lower it to the, the like, crazy-looking yeah, image where it's like a negative image of you. <laughs> You're... Wow. What do uh, we think? Can you hear me now? All right, Ben. You know, ben I'm that you guys are asking this question because I think one of the things that we have seen from uh, going... I tell you what. Sorry, Tracy, go ahead. Kevin, um, why don't you use the chat and we can uh, we can work it out. Um, we're really struggling right now trying to decide how much do our you know do our teachers need to do the creation and how much do you search for that external source um, for the rich data. And you know we are trying to find that happy medium and, and I would love to hear what you guys think. What is you know, what are you seeing after have done this for some period of time? What is your recommendation or what are your thoughts? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, uh, Dan, do you want to try that one? And then we'll try and get Kevin. Sure. And um, Mark, I think you were talking a little bit about um, like the Web 2.0 tools and, and the things that are available. And I feel like um, that's kind of where we've come from. You know, we haven't gone out and purchased a, a curriculum package because I, I feel like all the pieces are there on the internet. You just have to uh, uh, know where to look. You know, I mean, whether it's CK12 or um, you know these other sites that have content available, or or just even the the um, I don't know the the education community through sites like EduCreations, where people have just created uh, videos and content. Um, for free that you can just grab and so what I do with my teachers is is we do create the content but a lot of it we just pull from other teachers and educators who say you know hey here's my lessons here's the stuff I've done take it remix it do whatever you want to and um, you know that that costs us nothing and, um, and it's not a ton of work for um, for teachers because as I mentioned before, you know, taking a package from one classroom and putting it in another classroom doesn't always work, and so it's nice for the teachers to kind of pick and choose um, what tools, what, what videos, what resources they want to put um, either on their website or kind of their own little content management system. So if I'm hearing you right, you sort of err on the side of teacher creation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mark, what, what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, you know, I think that um, there's just a wealth of free stuff, and, and it's, uh, it's, it's a really amazing thing to be able to just go to the, the web and find tools. And, uh, you know, Dan mentioned some places you can find out there um, that, where, that, that host how-to videos. And I think that's one of the things when you're in a situation like the one that uh, sounds like the, the folks at Tracy School are in, where you're maybe making a transition and you're you're going one to one and um, you know I do a lot of consulting now with schools that are going to one to one and they're like okay we've got these great devices but what do we do with them <laughs> and uh, you know the, I, the the first thing I think that some maybe um, you know not to vilify anyone but to to um, to say some misguided maybe curriculum people will say well, let's go get this package thing. Let's go get a learning management system, and let's all use the same stuff. And I, I'm just not a big believer in that. Uh, I think you'd be better off getting some maybe a, a, some brief in-house professional development. Uh, seek out the people in your own house who are the experts, because there are some. I mean, you know, there in in every building, there's someone you know like the people here. I think who know how to find these things and to help other people. You know, in my building, I was that person. So people would come to me and say, hey, here's what I'd like to do. Do you know of anything that, that can help us do that? And I'd say, yeah, well, you should go try this tool or go check out that tool. And here's a how-to video. Um, so, you know, I would go that way for sure because there's just too much free stuff. We need to save money. Spend it on technology. Absolutely. So I think that brings up a good point for me. Um, you know, one of the things I, I sort of 
uh, struggle with the most is in where we invest our, our time and energy. And um, in thinking about the idea that we are coaching people, right, um, and thinking about that we're supporting teachers that are, that are on their way here, um, when we say that we're investing in the, the tools themselves um, versus investing in the people, uh, I think that, that, that we have some, some trouble there. So um, one of the questions that keeps on coming up is how do you get people, uh, especially teachers, to feel like this is something that is an investment in them and not an investment like I'm putting more things in the classroom. Um, and so, you know, I, you know, while I agree, yes, you can't talk about editing Google Docs and collaborating without the tools in the classroom to do it. But in your coaching, how do you sort of think about it so that it, it really does feel like we are investing in, this, in the, um, the social and human capital side of things and not just in the technology side of things. Um, Dan, what are you thinking? Um, well, I mean, you can sit there and tell your teachers that, hey, this is going to save you time. You know, you can, we can eliminate direct instruction in the classroom and, and all your time can be spent on small group instruction, but um, they won't believe you unless they see it. And so um, I like to... Um, uh, I like to start small and show them how, like, uh, this one particular lesson, let's do a collaborative Google Doc, and here, we're just going to basically plan everything out, and we're going to do a screencast as a video, and um, so you're not going to have to do the direct instruction, we'll just do this little video, and then I kind of let it go, and, and we go through the lesson, and we spend time on it, and then they can kind of see it firsthand, wow, that was great, it was successful, I was really able to meet with all my kids, I got some great data. Um, and then, you know, other teachers hear about it, and so I, I like to, um, you know, bring in other teachers to, to listen um, to that classroom, to see the examples, and then they want it, and then they're invested in it, and so they don't feel like it's extra work because they've seen it um, from the teacher down the hallway who's been successful, and then they want it in their own classroom. Um, and so, again, I, I think you can, you can preach to them and say, hey, this is going to, free up your time, it's going to um, allow you to focus more on students, um, but until you can actually show them, um, it's, it's difficult to, um, for them to understand it. Now, I, I really like that idea of, of showing what blended learning looks like, because I think that um, that becomes one of the easiest ways of saying, hey, this works or this doesn't work. Um, but sort of revealing that. Tracy, what are you guys doing in your district to help teachers to see one another's practice or to uh, hold up some examples um, of, of what good or best even practice might look like? And we've done a lot of um, talking about this, and I'm going to actually hand it over to some of the coaches because um, I'd like to have you guys be able to hear from them. So does anybody want to answer that? I will. We have six um, teachers per high school that we have um, coined as the e-leads. So they are our technology-rich classrooms that are going to be kind of model-type classrooms for other teachers to feel like they can walk through, you know, see some good <coughs> pedagogy and start the technology-rich, you know, element because I said we have a lot in the hopper right now, not just are we one-to-one, -one, but we're starting the tackling of the blended learning. So we felt like that would be a good place to build capacity for our teachers to have, you know, a place to go where they could see um, students engage in the device. <clears throat> Anybody else on that end? I think the other things, too, are, you know, being a, in a high school, I've taught in this high school and then moved into the role of coach, and I feel like over the last several years, I've seen us make a transition from being a very closed door environment to more of an open collaborative culture. And, you know, for example, one of the things that we tried doing this year uh, is we're doing some campus crawl weeks where we are encouraging every teacher to just take, whether it be five minutes or the entire plan hour, and hop in some classrooms see what's going on and try to steal an idea that you can use yourself or share with somebody else and 
and really just trying to do little things, getting our teachers on Twitter to build their own environments and, and create spaces that we can share. Um, I think a challenge and an exciting area of progress that we've made is, is getting that sharing going on a lot more often than just on PD days and all the times in between. So those are just a couple little things we've tried that I think have worked well. Absolutely. And now we're starting to also look at our next PD day. You know, what are some things that we can do that would enhance those days to make sure that your professional development is actually hitting um, the classroom where we want it to happen? So, you know, looking um, at iShare sessions, and those kinds of things. So we're always looking for new ways um, from all of you who might have some great ideas on how to get and make sure that that professional learning is really happening and, um, and getting down to that granular level. Kevin, it looks like you're back, so I'm going to let you uh, try and, and tackle this question. We're really just talking about how do you make sure that teachers know what it looks like, uh, and, and I'd love to tap your experience of, of really um, working with the teachers at Grant Beacon or even more recently around the district at the, the Janus Blended Learning Lab sites. How did you make sure that people know what what great blended learning practice looks like and so that they're not so much just in their classrooms. How did you open up the, the doors um, to, to multiple classrooms? Um, okay, well, so of course knowing that there's a variety of ways that, that we have to approach it, it's like anything else, right? So, you know, there were there are already the tools. There was, for me, you know, specifically when I was doing the blended learning coaching over at my school, it required, like, you know, team teaching, team planning, um, going in and actually being in the room. Um, so there was a lot of instructional coaching where we could, you know, look at the things that the people were doing and then start having conversation around, you know, what would you like it to look like. Um, in addition to that, um, there was a thing, and you know I did this last year, where I sat down and I decided I'd write down what are all the uh, things I think make a blended lesson, and that's where I came up with, like, my BL litmus test. And so... Uh, those are the kinds of things that I use in my planning, but you know, for just just like anything else, this is one of those big concepts that can be kind of hard to wrap your head around when you're new to it. So I think that the 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 key thing for my point, uh, my part was, you know, make the connection myself at first, and then once I had a crop of people that were actually really skilled uh, at doing this kind of work, then I actually went out and found people who were also trying to do the work and made those connections. I hope I hope that helps. Yeah, well, and, and to me, the, the making connections is actually the most powerful part, right? Like, you, you were oh, saying... Oh, I should have said it earlier. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, you're, you're making those connections very real for people, and I've seen you do this a number of times, which is, like, the most informal version of coaching um, that I've seen, which is, is, like, you and you have now met, now do something awesome together. Like... Yeah, that so, alone is is a really interesting sort of way of, of doing that. Can you talk a little bit about how you how you kind of approach that? I mean, you've made this sort of real world connection, and now you're saying go be awesome. Um, well, I tell you what, I think I think there's a couple of things at play here, and one of the things that I always I, I always fear is uh, um, I I know I know that when you want something really big to happen, especially when you're looking at a district like kind of initiative or anything like that. One of my things is, is that the person oftentimes gets forgotten, so I always want to go down and actually make those connections first, knowing that the answers are generally in the room. So as far as me connecting with the people, I actually keep a folder where I, that I call e-introductions, so I remember who all I've, I've introduced to who all else. But I also, um, I also do, you know, like I say, the, the position I'm in right now as a field manager allows me to be in contact with a number of different people. And so, like, the, like a very usual thing I would hear is, well, yeah, 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 but I teach elementary, and that's different from the secondary, you know. And so one of the things that I would generally try to do is pair people with similar interests. Now, Ben, I can also speak a little bit to, I mean, you, you talk a lot about when we're looking at professional development, um, you know, it's that, it's that, uh, Needs, strengths, and interests are the things that usually drive people to PD. But I also think that the, it comes down to, uh, in addition to that, there's that other realm of, you know, what is my mode of learning? How do I prefer to learn? And so that's why I'm, you know, trying to. I believe the power really does come from the connections, and so I also believe that, you know, as tempting as it is to do as much of this in virtual space, there are people whose mode of learning is not on the computer, but they will, they can teach using the computer, you know. So. Um, for me, it's also been making that physical connection. So a good example is I had a, what is it? I, I bought appetizers 
and I invited a bunch of people to come hang out, and then I mingled and then connected them. You know, it's like a what is it, speed dating or something? <laughs> but it's something kind of like that where we were able to connect people based on that um, that idea of what I already knew about them, and I thought that they would be actually good collaborators. I love that, and uh, and you know, I was able to watch some of that in, in action, and and I found that pretty compelling. Um, Mark, you you have a lot of experience with. PD experience, face-to-face -face PD and things like that. You know, you lead lots and lots of sessions. What are you finding that works the best to to really encourage people to take ownership? Um, and, you know, actually one of the other questions that, that came across was, you know, that encourages them to think of this as not something extra. There are a couple of questions in here around, you know, there's so much on my plate. How could I take on something extra, something more, um, things like that? How do you, how do you, you know, find some effective use in PD, but don't make it seem like, you know, uh, this is in addition to all of the standards work and in addition to all of the, you know, work that we're doing in on, on Project X and, and things like that. Well, first of all, it's a, it's a really challenging task. Um, you know, there there is so much right now for educators, and you know, time is. Uh, when when I'm out in front of people, I always when I talk about time, I say it's our most precious thing. You know, we we teachers always would like to have more, and there's the, how do I do this one more thing? One of the things that I have found that's helpful, and and I think Ian kind of talked a little bit about this too, and I really love the idea. It works for me as well. Um, you know, saturation is one. You, you have to get people using things in PD sessions. You know, I, one of the things that I, I know I always hated, and I'm sure anyone watching this will agree, the, the old PD where you just kind of go in and you listen to someone talk and they maybe show you some slides and, you know, maybe take notes, and then that's it. Um, it just doesn't work. You have to have people doing <coughs> thing that I have found that's really helpful, and this I think helps with taking away from that being overwhelmed, is I have really um, gone to cutting back on how much I share in a PD session. Um, you know, I mean, I'll do a day, and it, it'll be, you know, seven hours with one group. I used to go in and say, I'm going to show you guys 20 amazing web tools, social media, mobile learning strategies, boy, you're going to leave here with so much. You know, and then I started getting feedback from those people with through surveys and just dialogue, and they would say, boy, you showed us a lot of stuff, but it's overwhelming. I don't even know where to begin. So, you know, that was really, um, that was a, a great influence for me because what I've started doing now is cutting way down. Um, you know, I'm going to be in Philadelphia next week, and um, I really have worked on my session. And one of the things I've gone to is what I call five must-have tools. And I just think, you know, for me, from my experience at all levels, really starting almost from first grade and going up through uh, you know, high school, I think that for me there are there are I mean, there's probably more than that, but there are five tools that every teacher can use and in one way or another and be effective. So I say, I'm going to give you something here. We're going to use it in the session. So you don't have to say, well, I don't have time to learn it because we're going to learn it here. So um, I don't know if that totally answered your question, but I, I, that's really, really light. Also, Kevin, I want that BL litmus test. I'd like to see that. Love <laughs> okay. that. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll find it for you. I actually had to switch to a different computer so or on my drive. Actually, I wanted to comment on what Mark said, and I think something that I thought was really uh, poignant for me was like I, I I forgot what it was like when I was first learning all this stuff, you know, and I and I convinced my sister, she's an educator as well, to go with me to an ed camp, <laughs> and she and I sat in the very first session, and she got a really cool tool, that and and actually if you haven't heard of it, it's called News ELA. It's awesome. Uh, it it takes news articles and breaks it down into uh, uh, by Lexile level. Anyway, but she found this cool tool. And she's like, this is exactly what I wanted. And then she sat there the rest of the day with me to uh, 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 to learn nothing else but to look at that tool the whole rest of the time, right? So the point being that, you know, she just found the one thing that she wanted that day, and she used the time to work on it. So, 
Yeah, I think that's great. And Kevin, yes, please do uh, send over the, the litmus test to everybody. But Mark, I'm going to ask you, so if you've got top five, there are some people on the question asking, uh, or the Q&A here, who are asking about a couple of, you know, specific resources. So if you have a top five, what are they? <laughs> Oh, I don't know. Can I give that information away? <laughs> it sounds proprietary. <laughs> uh, it's top secret. Um, I'll, I'll give at least a couple, um, and I don't know that I would put these in any specific order, but uh, in terms of digital assessment, my favorite tool is Socrative, um, and uh, that's S-O-C-R-A-T-I-V-E. And so Crative is an amazing instant feedback tool that kids love. Now, I use this with grades as low as um, seventh grade, but um, I just recently practiced with my own kids for a PD session that I'm doing, and they're 10 and 11. So uh, you can use it with young kids, and they really like it because what you basically get kids, you say, you know, go into your class and say, hey, we're going to have a quiz, and see how many kids go, oh, yes. <laughs> but if you, you go in and you teach them Socrative, they will actually start to ask you to use it. I love that when my middle school kids would come in and say, can we use Socrative today? And I would say, wait a minute, you're telling me that you want a quiz? Because that's really what it is, is it's a really brief sort of online. They can use mobile devices if the kid's got an iPod or something else. Really a phenomenal tool. Um, my, other things I like are tools that get... Um, kids communicating. I think that uh, you know we deal with a, a, a wide array of kids and, and a lot of kids are shy and a lot of kids don't want to raise their hands and don't want to communicate but they're always willing to do it online. Um, so if you can get them using tools where they write their opinion, where they communicate with peers in a live environment um, that's great. Uh, Today's Meet is one that I love. It mimics Twitter. It's live. It's based on 140 characters. Uh, you don't need an account. You can you can literally a teacher can set up a Today's Meet room in one minute and have kids all on either computers or mobile devices in that same room chatting back and forth about any topic and that is truly powerful and you will get 100 percent participation. Uh, it's, it's really amazing. Um, I'll do one more. I've got one more for, um, I, know, I don't know if we have any people watching who are in the low low levels pre-K, K1, but you know this, another thing I find when I'm in sessions a lot is being a middle school and I also taught a little bit of high school, you know you tend to talk about what you're comfortable with and I've often heard people say, you don't really say things that are aimed at the lower grades. So again, I always try to listen to feedback. I've tried really hard to add some things in. Um, I came across something that I think is one of the neatest apps that has been developed in a long time. It's, it's called Color App, and it's C-O-L-A-R, Color App. Um, Color App provides these um, drawings that kids can color and when you hover your iPad or your iPhone over what you've colored it literally comes to life. It will get up, if it's an animal, it will dance, it will fly, it has a dragon that will shoot fire out, it's three, it's like cool. virtual reality, it is one of the coolest things I've seen and I think creative pre-K K teachers can do a whole lot more now than just say, hey, color inside the lines. You can really do some neat things with that. Yeah, I, I mean, that augmented reality piece and, and sort of thinking about living objects, um, uh, living sort of uh, physical objects that then can become digital objects. I mean, I, I find that to be really um, kind of a, a, a new way of looking at the world around us. Um, I just got a note from my wife. This is something that's really happening. I can break the, uh, the news to you. There's uh, apparently an active shooter around my kids' elementary school, which is ah. so my, my kids are on lockdown right now. It's, they're not, it's not at the school, but clearly uh, not great. So if I... <laughs> 
So anyway, um, yeah. So one of the things that uh, that I think we think about a lot, but only in the background, is is actually the um, the teacher pipeline that comes to us, or that we are are thinking about, um, sort of that pre-service uh, teachers or or folks who are in um, you know programs that are student teaching and things like that. Um, we had a question that came in here. What do you think should be incorporated into teacher education courses so that these pre-service teachers are exposed to blended uh, learning and blended pedagogy um, before they graduate? Um, and, and this would obviously apply to people who are, are new teachers and things like that within our schools because we end up working with a lot of these folks. But what's the tactic that we should take with these pre-service or even just new teachers um, that are that are in you know they're in graduate school or they're you're even going through alternative licensure programs you know what's an essential component that you would want to have as a part of that Dan I'm gonna start with you well I think their courses should be blended um, yes sir <laughs> right modeling it maybe okay yeah. um, I think I, I was totally on board with what uh, Mark and Kevin were saying about you have to experience, you know. I, I just finished up a, a multimedia two level master's course, and guess what the final is for a multimedia class? It's a right, right. yeah, it's a paper, right? So <laughs> right. I mean, come on, you you can't you can't teach um, or you can't show teachers how to do this unless you, you believe in it and 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 you um, can actually train your teachers that way. And so I I think that. Um, uh, Mark, you were talking about uh, no more traditional PDs where I'm in front talking. Um, you know, I try to build online blended um, PDs for my teachers where part of it is you, you go to this website, there's maybe a reading, watch this video, almost like a flipped model, and then we meet and apply so that knowledge kind of is fronted up to them, and then when we meet, it's the hands-on, it's the engaging, and so I think that's part of it, and I also think that um, we need to expose our teachers um, to uh, the NETS standards. I don't think teachers know that well enough. Um, uh, the, the technology content, um, pedagogy knowledge framework, um, digital blooms taxonomy, I think there's a lot of things like that that um, really help teachers look at their technology and go, oh wow, so research is a, a low level thinking skill, but you know, a video blog is higher order. Um, those kinds of things where as they're teaching, they can kind of almost self-assess themselves. Yeah. Nice. Um, I would say, Tracy, what, are, what would you want to see from that perspective? Um, from a PD producer or a PD participant? Like, I mean, really what I'm thinking about is what would you... Uh, what would you want um, to be a part of pre-service education so that they they come ready to be coached or ready to 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 use blending in their in their classroom? I mean that's a great question because I think that you know we we work with that right now looking at how do we get everybody thinking about this innovative teaching st you know style. Um, but yeah, I think that. A lot of our young people are coming in, and what we find, um, oftentimes people will say that your veteran teachers are not embracing technology, but what I actually see is a lot of times they're the ones who will because they already know how to teach. And so mm -hmm. you've got these new people coming into the environment where um, not only now are they um, trying to use technology, and we all know that a lot of times kids are great with technology for entertainment purposes, but whether or not they can apply it in an instructional manner is another, you know, another thing. But so we've got um, people coming into schools right now trying to figure out what does the technology look like, but then also with no experience teaching. So I, I feel like that is, it's kind of like a double whammy. So we're no, seeing a lot, of our, you know, a lot of our veteran teachers are actually embracing the technology because that's one thing for them to think about, and they're already masters in the classroom. And so almost it, it becomes this element of, of you know, if, you, if you're modeling it, then, then great, but the, the actual teaching practice and, and sort of the, uh, the way of, um, of, of encouraging students learning and ownership of learning, like that to me is the, uh, is the, the frame, right? It's not, you know, 
the technology first and then they become teachers, right? They're teachers first. And, and that to me is really a, a, an engaging point. Kevin, anything you would want to add to that? Well, actually, uh, I think we're kind of in a... Well, two things, actually. One is uh, that doc that you asked for, um, I put it into the group chat, so if anyone wants to look at it. Keep in mind, nothing I do is prescriptive. <laughs> this is my thinking about how I planned. I have no intention of those docs going out and becoming the way. Uh, but it was really useful for my teachers. I actually was visiting one the other day who said, you know, actually, all I do now is just sit down with your sheet of paper, and I ask that as I'm doing my lessons. And, it, you know, just it's a series of questions. That's really all it is. But anyway, so to your point, Ben, I would say we're in this interesting situation right now where, um, <clears throat> just like I say PD, why, why would people deliver PD any differently if it always has looked the same way, you know, and so, like, they can't, like, it's hard for people to grasp. They have no anchor uh, to attach to. So I do agree that actually colleges and, you know, all the prep work that would go into preparing a teacher into getting into the classroom to Daniel's point, they really do need to see it modeled. And what I think is actually going to, this is, this is, maybe this is a, 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 like a horrible loop to be stuck in. If it isn't happening, you know, in their K through 8 and then their high school, especially their high school career, when they get into college, they don't, the students may not be able to actually say, I expect better of you, professor. <laughs> I really want my, my learn to be this way, right? And so I think for, Truthfully, I think when it comes to those education programs, there's a level of advocacy that has to be coming out from the students. And right now, I don't know if there's a crop of students in there that actually has been exposed. So I don't know. It's not really a solution or anything. It's more just a, this is my observance. I think actually if we are doing the right things in our public schools and uh, as kids are moving up and through, then I, it's, there's going to be almost no hope for the universities to not change. You know what I'm saying? Yes. I don't know that that's going to be, you know, like we systems are are difficult to change, and but I, I I think that they are, you know, to a certain extent, it will be obsolete if we do not sort of push push that forward, and and um, so yeah, so th at this point we've got about ten minutes left of the of the session. Um, and actually, I'd like to do some, some rapid fire here because um, I want to get all of the, the questions that just came in. Um, I want to at least uh, sort of pay attention to them. Um, so we have most successful uh, approach is to use technology tool training in immersion during my professional development efforts. They learn the technology by using it and from a student perspective. Um, we have one teacher who does a really good job of actually including students. Um, Dan, Mark, Kevin, or Tracy, does anybody actually include students in their uh, professional learning experiences to any sort of authentic degree? How are you including them um, and, and not using them as a prop, but how are you including them and, and then making it authentic? Anybody, and just one of you, you can sort of say, yes, we do that. I didn't, have, I didn't understand Twitter until a kid showed me how. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, like, I mean, I don't know if you're talking about Ben physically, like, having a kid in the room, but I know every time I talk about, like, um, with, 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 I'm at the teacher or a grade level or whoever, and I'm like, yeah, you know, we can get um, these kids on a Google Doc and they can collaborate and, you know, you can reply with comments and stuff and, and there will be a teacher or a few teachers who will say, um, 30 kids on one document at once, that's impossible. Like, you can't do it. And so then I'll pull up the doc that the kids are working on right there and, you know, start leaving comments and commenting with the kids and they can see this kind of living, breathing document um, that's actually working right in front of them. And so I, I feel like I do always pull in at least a student work example, either something they've created or they've built and done and then share that with teachers and then it's kind of like it, it flips it on the head to this can't be done to, oh, I want that now in my classroom, so come help me do this. So th that idea of using student work is huge. And sort of thinking about how do we use real examples of what's happening in the classroom to help shift other examples of what's happening in the classroom. So that I love. I absolutely love it. It brings up this other question of, um, of if districts banded together to share the cost of developing uh, tools, 
Um, wouldn't that actually be easier, better, more effective than everybody trying to create it on their own or having to purchase an off-the-shelf? And I would say the same about wouldn't it be easier, better, more awesome to actually collect all of our student examples and say these are great examples of what it looks like from that perspective? Does anybody have any thoughts on that one? I want to I think about that one as well. Yeah, I would like to see them band together to... Um, maybe combine the resources to purchase better PD because I, I think that um, again we talked earlier about using the, the free resources so I mean to, there's so much out there that we can use but still the teachers are not using it so I think if you have districts that are going to come together and say hey let's pool our resources and let's go out and find people to come in um, I think that would be a much better way to do it. <clears throat> I like that idea of, of actually pooling resources for PD. We're talking about, let's say it's EdCamps, or let's say it's other models where you are, it's, it's not just your school or your district that is focused on, on that idea. Um, any other ideas of how, how we pool resources and come together as schools where we're not competing for the same kids or competing for the same resources. Tracy, I'm seeing a lot of head nodding in that room. <laughs> uh, you were just trying to decide if we, I don't have a good answer for that one, but one thing I was thinking about with the student work, I feel like we've tried, or student examples is, we have tried to really bring some student panels into our PD, and I think that has been hugely mm -hmm. beneficial uh, from just hearing from students and kind of getting to fire questions at them, but outside of the real context of the classroom. But I know that's not the question we're on, but I thought mm -hmm. I had. That's great. We, we did something really a little um, similar where we didn't bring kids in, but we did student perception surveys. I had the teachers basically give a survey to their kids and then sit down and look at like what their kids are saying about class and what they want to see in their classrooms. And um, that really pushes teachers well, and I think they enjoy that. Mm. Really interesting. All right, rapid fire. There's somebody that says, I don't understand the need for so much immediate data. It seems to preclude reflection as a method for deeper understanding. I get the image of a child's brain being thought of as an Amazon warehouse. Somebody respond. I agree. <laughs> so what's the need for, the, for, for so much real-time data? Like, why... Why would we do that? What's the benefit here to having this real-time data, and, and how do we balance that w with deeper understanding? Hey, Ben? Yeah. So my thinking around real-time data oftentimes comes down to, um, you know, sometimes it's the questions asked, sometimes it's the thing that's being worked on. So if I'm thinking about uh, a great example for me in my past was, you know, the work I used to do when, it, when I would try to teach kids ge uh, geography. Like, you know, not debating the skill, but if I wanted people to understand Europe and understand all the countries and, you know, microstates and everything that exists up in there, for me to actually teach a kid about Europe and then get them to understand just general locations about countries would take a long time where I could, the instant feedback in and of itself allowed me to have put the kids on, say, Shepard software. They could actually play the maps, do the maps, do the things over and over and over again. It becomes gamified and leveled up. And then the retention I would see with those students was really high level and that was the kind of learning that I really did not you know I didn't actually have to be as involved in because those that's the rote memory stuff but when yep. you get beyond that when you're asking the higher level questions sometimes it's even just the scripting of the question should be able to give you the information that you can see the students are actually lacking on um, you know the way I write a question if I actually write it in such a way that you know which is the, the most likely answer and then of the other three answers it actually reveals where their weak point is did I actually have to be involved in that step of the student figuring out, oh, I didn't get this, and so now I need to go do this? Or should I be, you know, it's freeing up that time, in essence, for me to have the kids doing their own self-remediation, and it doesn't actually take me out of the equation because I'm still able to then pull and conference kids, and I know what to conference to as opposed to uh, still trying to guess why they didn't get it. Nice. So I love the, the combination of both of those things. Um, all right, so somebody asked, just can you share the student perception survey that you used? Um, and so that's a, another request as well. So I'm going to just say, yes, you can, and be done with that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, a couple of last questions here. 
We have issues with faculty who are too self-conscious to allow use of video, lecture capture, many other digital tools that expose themselves. So any suggestions for, for how to deal with that idea that we're putting ourselves out there um, and, and maybe I'm not ready for that? Um, uh, Mark, a, a, does that come up when you talk to teachers at all? Uh, not specifically about videotaping, but I think the, the idea of, um, you know, the fear of doing something wrong comes up a lot. Uh, you, hear, you know, the fear of, I don't know how to do it. I, I don't know how to work this tool. So Creative sounds really nice, but I don't, I don't know. I'm not good with computers. Um, you know, our computers break down in class. That kind of stuff. So, you know, I, I mean, it happens. I mean, I think what you... You know, I don't know that there's a silver bullet answer. I, I would I tell people to um to to practice. You know, it, do you know when I go out? I, I as you said earlier, I mean I get in front of people all the time, and uh, you know there's anxiety with that when you're talking to adults. You know, I, I'm afraid. You know, I mean I, we're all sitting here. I mean, what do I look like? What am am I doing something silly? Um, you know, I practice my presentations. I want to make sure I'm, I'm I don't screw up. I think you have to do the same thing. Practice with your web tools. If it's about video, get in a room and get yourself videotaped and take a look at it and say, oh, that, that was awkward, now I want to do something different. You just got to practice. That's what we ask kids to do. You know, Ben, the other thing that we've been talking a lot about, and um, we've spent a lot of time with our staff telling them one and done. Because quite frankly, you know, and, and Sarah says it best with um, having broadcasters in you, you never like what your voice sounds like. You never like what you look like. Um, and sometimes you just have to get out there and try it. And the more people that we ask on their way out of a PD to do some type of a video recap or share their learning um, and, and let them actually physically try it, the more you break down those barriers and people are like, okay, that wasn't so bad. But if, um, I don't know, Sarah tried, the first time we were working with some of the screencasting, I kept telling her, Sarah, it's one and done, one and done. And she, after like 30 or 40 takes, she said, I finally, you know, stopped and I, I was done with it. And, uh, and now how much easier is it? Oh, it's a lot easier. And I think just modeling it, you know, the fact that we don't like it, but we, we are show that we're willing to do it, I think has made a lot of teachers more comfortable with trying it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think you, know, when you're, you know, you're in a regular presentation and you sneeze, you just keep on moving. You don't say, okay, everybody walk out of the room, come back in, and let's start that over again. <laughs> I mean, you're going to some do things that are just, you know, real. So yeah, well, we like it to keep, and we try to keep it real around. I 100% I agree. And the only thing that I would add to that is, is I, I try and, and do one of two things. One is lower the barrier to entry as much as I possibly can. So if if the, the process of recording is like I have to use a video camera, and then I have to edit it, and then I have to upload it. Like, that's too much. If I can get somebody to record something on their phone and email it to me and I upload it, or if I can set up an email inbox that will upload it for them, like, lowering the barrier to entry for them it can mean the difference between trying and not trying or, or thinking it's too much, too crazy, you know, uh, and so, and after talking, I don't remember what the second thing I do is, but, uh, <laughs> but, the, the, but the idea of, of actually um, really just making it as, as easy as possible um, and, and then and sort of simplifying it as much as possible. I, uh, um, you know, one of the tools that I just found this past week is, is called LiceCap, L-I-C-E-C-A-P. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's a way of making screencasts using animated GIFs, um, and so you can actually do that. So you're not using your voice, but you're screencasting, and then you can put them into a Google Doc and step them through a process. But it's not images; it actually moves and does those kinds of things. And so to me, that it's lowering the barrier of entry. Like I don't have to use my voice; I can just capture the the video. I can put it into a document, make it make it easier. We have hit the uh, the end of the, the round table here, and I'm going to do the same thing that Kevin did, which is you have all now met each other. Now go do something awesome together. Um, and so my hope is that you'll sort of maintain contact on Google+. Plus. All of the people in the audience, I really appreciate all of the amazing questions. We have had um, at various points uh, over 50 people 
watch um, this session um, and at least at least that many questions. Um, I have found that actually if I don't select them, then they go away and disappear forever. So I'm going to select and say done all of these at the end here. Um, but I really appreciate you guys taking part, and, uh, and my hope is that we, we continue the conversation. Sounds good. Thanks. Thank you Thanks so much. We appreciate it. Nice, nice meeting, everybody. Later. Nice to meet you. Just going to select and done. You can leave at any time. Thanks, Ben. See you guys. Bye. All right, take care. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Oh, hey, Ben, I put the link to the community into this chat as well. I thought that Excellent. might be useful. Thank you. Yep, cool. I'm signing out now. Okay, see you later, man. Peace out. So what do you think? Is that useful? Yeah. I mean, it's, I'm sure I can. Yeah, it's not super hard or, or anything like that, but I find, you know, that that kind of conversation really does get people further along and and, and helps them to, to think about a lot of the you know, what comes next? How do I do this? Are there other people that are working on the same thing? And, right. You know, and we had, um, we had, you know, people from the district, people outside of the district all coming together and sort of talking about these things, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank so you for you. attending. Thank you for having uh, me. You too. Hopefully we'll uh, get to hang out a whole bunch more. I hope so, too. Maybe not next week. I'll be at Creating Connections. Ooh, create those connections. Yeah. All right. Bye-bye.